wiggity welcome back, folks, to some more Death Gate. The last episode, we got into the Necromancer's study and got a couple spells from him. For now, we're going to head back to the Dragon Ship and check out some other areas here. Mainly, Cletius' palace. Cletus. You ship is docked. <laughs> you ship. That's a little misprint there. So I think that should be your ship. It is docked next to a dark stone palace. Lights in the windows indicate that it is inhabited. Oh, really? You don't say. I always say before I. Palace, cave, palace, cave, which way, which way? You take a few steps in, but the cave quickly branches into many tunnels. You become very confused, so you turn back. Okay. Who are you? Whoa. What are you doing here? Whoa! You walk perfectly toward the front entrance. The guard there stares at you in wonder, never having expected anyone to willingly walk into the palace. You explain that you're trailing the refugees from Telestia. The god claims he doesn't know what you're talking about, but a knowing look to his companion leads you to believe otherwise. They inform me that all visitors must see the dynast. He makes it a habit to greet them personally and hold a banquet in their honor. Again, the knowing look that passes between the gods is disquieting. With a grip that is more insistent than friendly, the first god escorts you to the palace. You wait for about an hour in a bar room with a single door and no windows. Then the same guard takes you to a large room with a long table piled with food and drink. At the head of the table, a man wearing rich robes and a crown of gold sits in a throne-like chair. A broad, welcoming smile on his face, he invites you to sit and partake of this meal set out in your honor. For lack of a better plan, you sit the fuck down. Greetings, my friend. My name is Clytus the Fourteenth. I am the dynast of Abarak, and I rule here, but you probably know that. I'm always pleased to receive visitors. I get so very little. Please, tell me how things are in the outer reaches. I'm not your friend, Clitius. I'm not your friend, Clytus. Such hostility. What have I done to deserve that? I say that I'm your friend. I merely wish to know how I can be of service to you. Are you a refugee? Are there others of you that require assistance? I'm alone. So, you don't represent anyone? You don't require assistance? Very well. You know, you look very different. Foreign. I've seen people from all over Abarak, and you look like none of them. Who are you? Where are you from? I'm from a remote Karn in the Outer Reaches. You probably haven't heard of it. Where are my manners? You've probably been traveling for some time and are very hungry. I've been forcing you to converse while all of this food has lain here getting cold. You have my leave to partake. We will talk more later, I'm sure. I'd rather not if you don't mind. I'm not very hungry. Perhaps a toast would be appropriate. We must drink to our new relationship. I'm sure that we will grow to be exceptional friends. The dynast produces a bottle of red wine from the bar behind him and pours a single glass. He orders a dead servant to take the glass from his hand and places it before Please him. accept this special wine. I only bring it out for special occasions. I'm sure you'll find it to be... unique. He stares at you like a vulture. Waiting for you to drink from the crystal glass, you notice that he is not holding a similar glass. I think I'll save this for later, if it's all the same. It is not the same, my friend. You will drink that wine, and you will do it now. I've lost all patience with you. He rises from the table and traces a spell in the air while you watch dumbfounded. The blue rune shoots across the banquet table and explodes in your chesticle. You expect to feel some pain, but all you notice is overwhelming hunger. You begin stuffing your mouth and pockets with food and drink. In spite of yourself, you snatch up the crystal goblet and drain the contents. Clitius smiles and sits back down, satisfied. I know you, patron. Our books talk about your race. 
We believed them to be legends, but here we have proof. And if you are real, how many more of the other legends could be true? The other realms? The Death Gate! Abarak is dying. There's no way to save it, but you represent a way into new worlds, fresh lands to conquer. After you are dead, your corpse will tell me everything I wish to know. You will help me destroy your own people. Think on this as the poison eats through your body. Guards, remove this trash. Soldiers grab you roughly from the chair and drag you down long, winding corridors, Clitius's laughter echoing in your ears. You quickly lose track of your route, your aching midsection demanding all of your attention. Soon you are thrown against a cold stone wall and shackles snap around your wrist. You slump to the floor as the guards stroll from the room, laughing at some private joke. You gather enough strength to look around the room. It's a stone cell. One wall has an open doorway suggesting the monocles are what keep the prisoners from escaping. A peg on the wall is home to a key on a ring, which looks like it might fit the lock to your shackles. It is, of course, out of reach. And we have learned the hunger spell. Another occupant of the cell is chained to the same wall that holds you prisoner. A thin crown along his brow attracts your attention. This sartan boy is some kind of royalty. Why he is confined in a dungeon is beyond you. The paleness of his skin, the occasional grunt and spasm all lead you to believe that he has had his share of Clitius' poison as well. It's Edmund. Hello, my name's Edmund. How are you doing? Oh, we got some steak. Got some motherfucking steak. That sounds good. You plop the steak on the ground next to you. The dog eyes it with disinterest. Evidently, it's e eaten recently. Oh, you're not hungry, are you? We'll see about that, you little shit. Gonna cast hunger on the dog here. You trace the rune structure in the air. It floats over to the curious dog, who attempts to take a bite out of it. Instead, it sinks into his body. Immediately, the dog begins to salivate. It looks around for something to eat. Anything! The rare steak lying on the ground catches the hound's eyes. It bounds over next to you and rips into the bloody meat, as if its life depends on it. Now that the dog is close enough, we're going to cast the Possession Spell. You trace runes in the air and place your hand on the dog's scruffy fur. The magic swiftly takes hold. You stiffen as you feel your soul passing away. Everything spins and you begin to panic. It all goes dark. The darkness doesn't last long. You quickly come to your senses and instantly discover that they aren't the same senses you've come to expect. Your vision not only perceives the world in shades of gray, although your hearing and sense of smell have been enhanced. You realize that you inhabit the body of the dog, and that this dog has been trained to track game by smell. This must be the body of Clitius's royal hunting hound. Holy shit, we're all in black and white. What the fuck? This is crazy awesome. Woof, woof. Look, I can smell and bark. I must be happy over there. Unfortunately, I can't take a shit. You're on one of many passages that runs through the palace's foundation. A stairway leads up to the more populated areas. You pat up the stairs, passing a number of alert guards. They pat you on the head and smile, but allow you to pass. Seems that the dog has the run of the palace. After a bit of exploration, which involves sticking your nose in a lot of empty rooms, you discover the original banquet room where you're escorted to. You've taken a good deal of time to locate it. However, you're very worried about the condition of your body. A long table takes up most of the banquet hall. There's also a wet bar with several bottles near the end. A simple glass bottle filled with some kind of liquid. You can't identify the color of the liquid or bottle because as a dog you only make out shades of gray. The wine in the bottle is strong, but not very distinct. It smells much like the other wines from the bar. You grab onto the neck of the bottle with your canine teeth and slide it out of the bar.
drop the bottle on the ground. You bite down on the key and slide the ring on the peg in the wall. The prince groans. Fuck the prince. You lay the key ring by your motionless body. You nuzzle your motionless body. The contact sparks the transference of your soul. Familiar dizziness overwhelms you, and when you recover, you're back in your human body. The dog looks at you with trusting, loyal eyes. Evidently, some bond was created when you passed your soul into its body. It sidles up to you, intent on accompanying you wherever you go. The poison feels like fire in your veins, slowly sapping your strength, slowing your heart. You take a big swig from the clear bottle. Grateful that you were able to tell it from the other colorless bottles when it didn't filter out any of the multicolored lines on the tablecloth. You feel the effects at once. The knots in your stomach loosen and the weight lifts from your limbs. You can feel that the liquid has cured you. You snatch the keyring from the ground. You slide the key into the lock holding your manacles shut. A quick twist pops the shackles open. The prince guzzles the remainder of the clear liquid. The effect is immediate. The pain drains from his face and body. He hands the empty bottle back to you with a sigh of relief. You move, you reach over the prince's manacles and insert the key into the lock. One click, and the shackles pop open. Alright. Yes, my friend? Would you accompany me? I'm looking to get out of here. I'd be happy to. Let's leave while we can. Let's. We got this kick ass dog companion as well. Behind a panel in that wall is a tunnel which leads directly to the docks. We should be able to sneak out to your ship and sail away before they know what's happening. When we're away, I'll direct you to the caves where my people hide. I must tell them about the situation here, and perhaps they can help you as well. You heave the door open and wander in the dark tunnels beyond, in a dimly lit chamber with ancient catacombs. You wander down the curving passage and quickly become lost eventually. Find yourself turned around back at the start. Oh, what, I'm not good enough for the catacombs? This is an incredible vessel! Great workmanship! I've never seen anything like it. I assume that the steering is similar to the ships that I've piloted. If you'll give me leave, I'll take us to the secret caves on the edge of the Fire Sea. You nod and Edmund, smiling, plants himself in front of the steering wheel. Thank you, my friend, for helping me escape. I will be forever in your debt, and I intend to help you in your quest. Right now, however, I must speak with some of the elders. I have to tell them about Clytus, and we must make plans. Clytus! If you go back to the palace, I will meet you there. We have a few ships ourselves that can take me. Until then, farewell. The prince disappears into the mob of Sartre. Mouth is all right there. What the fuck? You go 
through your repertoire of attention-getting devices, finally deciding on a straightforward tap on the shoulder. This causes the recipient to suddenly drop the play pieces he was shaking in his hand. He starts to protest, but when the other players begin to moan, his head drops. To look at the winning throw, he laughs. That was my luckiest throw of the night, and I owe it all to you. What are you doing? Doing? Why, we're playing Runebone. It passes the time while we're waiting for the prince to decide what we're going to do. I was losing all night until you nudged me. That last throw made up for my entire losing streak. What are those stones you want? They're not stones. They're rune bones. We make them from animal bones. Each unique rune bone has an individual rune carved into it, but they all interlock. When you throw them down, they form a design. If the bones fall in such a way that they form a legal spell, you win. And all the other players must contribute one of their rune bones to you. If no recognized spell is formed, you lose the bones you threw. Once you run out of rune bones, you're out of the game. Since I was responsible for your throw, don't you owe me some of your winnings? <laughs> sure, my friend. I guess you did bring me luck on my heaviest bet. I suppose I could let you have a few, just so you can practice a little at the game. If you get good enough, maybe we'll let you join in. He dumps four room bones into your hand. That's all. Thanks, pal. No problem. Got me some fucking room bones. How can I help you? You have to clear your throat repeatedly before the thin man lifts his sunken eyes from the book. When he does, you feel the piercing, burning intelligence of his gaze. Although his body is old and frail, you sense that his mind is as sharp as any you've ever encountered. Are you Balthazar? That I am. I'm afraid you have me at a disadvantage. Who did you say you were? I'm a friend of Edmund's. We met in Clytus' dungeon. Ah, of course. I thought I saw Edmund return. You assisted in his rescue. For that, we are eternally grateful. How can I help you? You're the same Balthasar who is the king's necromancer? That's correct. Although, as the royal necromancer, I suppose that I serve Edmund now. The king is dead? He wasn't a strong man. I think perhaps he had the plague at the end. It was befuddling his senses. The prince refused to assume the leadership from his father, so we followed the king until he died. Those were strange days. The king would lead us in circles as his mind slowly decayed. His death was inevitable. When someone contracts the plague, it is only a matter of time. What is this plague? We're not quite sure. For as long as I can remember, people have been falling prey to a mysterious sickness. We just call it the plague for lack of a better term. When someone contracts it, he dies days later. There is no cure. There doesn't seem to be any cause. It's not contagious in the usual sense. It strikes randomly. All of our efforts to learn more about it have proved futile. The plague has decimated our population. The dead far outnumber the living. Even if our world wasn't threatened by the imminent collapse of the Colossus, I question how long the plague will let us all live. I'd like to talk about something else. Certainly. What are you reading? This is just one of my own books on magic. I'm trying to master one of the lost arts. Illusion. I'm so close to the spell that I can taste it. A breakthrough last night has placed it just within reach. What was this breakthrough? I have been trying to construct the spell by taking a back route. I reasoned that if I discovered how to break an illusion, I might be able to build one. Last night, I happened upon the correct rune structure to unravel an illusion. Using this as a foundation, I should be able to construct the Create Illusion spell. How long will it take to work out the new spell? Only a couple of years. This breakthrough has shaved decades off my research. A couple of years? How long do you expect to be around? Oh, you're right. Sometimes I get too involved in my own work. 
with the Colossus corrupted, none of us will live out the year. But there's no use in wallowing in despair. I might as well continue, since it keeps me from dwelling on our fate. This is getting too technical for me. Let's talk about something else. Certainly. Thank you for your help. Perhaps we'll speak later. As you wish. Time to possess our best friend here. We're going to use our dog. A bitter sharp order draws your attention to the east. Through the dog's eyes you see a small tunnel that you missed before. Running into the cave wall, dry stale air from the opening carries a disturbing smell. An evil smell. It's a poop smell. It's not good at all. cave there. Turn back into the haplo. Yes, what is it now? Have you noticed anything unusual about that cave wall to the east? Unusual? No, it's just a cave wall. One of many, actually. Why? What would you say if I told you that it was an illusion? I'd say, how can you possibly know that? Your brain can't distinguish reality from illusion. You are a higher life form, aren't you? That's just an assumption, mind you. I've looked at it through the dog's eyes, and it's not there. What do you think that means? You mean you possessed the dog and he didn't see it? Yes, the... That would follow. The spell does not communicate with the lower life forms, and by possessing the body of such a form, you would bypass the magic of the illusion. You say it was the East Wall. It's an illusion. Imagine. I've been sitting this close to an illusion every day, eager for a chance to test my unravel illusion spell. I'll try it now. Balthazar wanders over to the cave wall. He touches it, even pushes it with all his might. With a questioning look in your direction, he waves his hands about, tracing blue glow lines in the air. When he has finished the final rune, the spell floats into the wall. The rock flickers, then dissolves like so much mist. Beyond, you see a small crawlway stretching into the darkness. It worked! It worked! This is exactly what my research needed. Now that I know the Unravel Illusion spell is correct, it won't take long to finish the Create Illusion spell. Balthazar dives back into his book and resumes reading with rekindled enthusiasm. You have learned the Unravel Illusion spell. When we enter the hidden tunnel here. There's another spell book, sweet. Uh-oh, it's book time! Necromancy 101 The Study of Satan Let it be known by any who would read this book who would learn of dark practice of necromancy, that it is forbidden. Let the reader do so at the peril to his soul and to those of his brethren. This tome is intended for information's sake only. He would disregard the warnings and undertakes to practice this discipline has committed a crime against his race, and at this time a crime punishable by death in the order of the Sartan High Council. If this warning strikes you as too harsh, you are obviously not familiar with the after effects of this art. Simply put, for every person brought back from death, another of his race shall die untimely. The spell is tantamount to murder, therefore it is treated as such. Necromancy is literally death magic. It can be used to draw back the spirit of the dead and force it to inhabit the body, as rightfully vacated. This does not bring the dead back to life, indeed the body loses its ability to feel and heal its wounds. 
Eventually, even the best kept corpse would be useless. Countless accidents and daily wear would eventually exhaust its potential. And the spirit never quite grasped what's happened. It exists in a state of constant confusion. In its own mind, it is reliving its past. It replays events that have it has experienced despite different environments. The lack of other players and props. So from this book, you're going to learn uh, the spell of resurrection. Your fingers touch the black material of the rope. It feels inexplicably cold. The frost runs up your arm and soon your whole body begins to shiver. The rocks of the cave seem to take a life on their own. And they whirl and twist and become something totally new. You realize that you are seeing the vision of an entirely different place. See a man dressed in a robe. <laughs> Although the room is dark, he is unmistakably Sartan. He stands in front of a gigantic stone spire covered with magic runes. His attention is focused on a large rune in the center of the spire. A nervous dwarf stands nearby, watching this man cast spell after spell at the rune. The wizard curses and yells. Blue fire strikes the stone, but without effect. Wolf quakes in fear, but remains steadfast. He approaches the rune with a... When he cautiously touches them to the rune, a massive explosion throws his body back like a ragdoll. The man shrieks again, but in frustration, he curses the dwarf's limp body from its weakness. The strength of madness enters the wizard, and even while maintaining the spells that hold the spire's rune at bay, he simultaneously casts a mighty spell, too quickly to memorize. A misty image of the dwarf appears floating over the body. Its expression is one of pain and terror, as if it's something has taken hold of it. In the manner of a rope wrapped around its foot, and it's dragging it back into the corpse. When the spirit image has been totally seduced by the body, the dwarf's eyes jerk open. The man in the black screams at the dwarf to finish the task. <laughs> up his hammer and wedge and approaches the spire. He touches the tools to the rune again. Again the magic reacts, and now the explosion only rips flesh from the bones, and somehow the dwarf manages to stay his ground. Five blows of the hammer force a chunk from the center of the rune to fall away. Immediately the rune's glow vanishes, and all the other runes on the spire grow a bit darker. The man in black laughs as he picks up a piece of the stone. He admires the rock in his hand as if it were some kind of relic. He turns his attention to the obvious hole in the spire's room. With his free hand, he weaves an intricate spell that is too complicated to follow, and suddenly the rune appears to be whole again. The strange pair exit the chamber, leaving the spire seemingly whole, but much darker than it started. The scene shifts. Now you see the same man seated on the throne. He holds a scepter, which he has, and his headpiece. It's the same chunk of stone from the spire. Others in his court display obvious fear their ruler and keep quiet, distant from him. The man seems to prefer it. You see no sign of the dwarf. Another scene. The wizard is much older. He is handing the scepter to another younger man whose face bears a close resemblance to that of the wizard. You can see the avarice and longing in his eyes and the reluctance in the eyes of the wizard in black. After the younger man has snatched the scepter away, he takes no further notice of the older wizard who walks slowly off. Now you see the old wizard in this very cave. He stands on the rock floor alone, the madness in his eyes overwhelming. He murmurs to himself for a while. You catch nothing, only the mouthing of a few words. They'll never find me and must never bring me back. Never. His hand waves aimlessly in the air, but then you begin to see the blue traces of a spell, too. The rune construct is completed. It flies into his body and explodes in flames. The wizard thrashes a bit, but in short order is no more than a pile of ash. Surprisingly, the robe he wore has been left untouched by the flame. Nothing happens for a while. Then you realize that the visions have ended, and that you are looking at the same scene only thousands of years later. The robe lies in the same place, covering the ashy remains of the old wizard. Tentatively, you pick up the robe, but no further images haunt you. 
by doing this, we learn the self-immolation spell. If you want to set yourself on fire, go ahead. Me, I got LPs to do. And we'll continue on with this LP in another video. Thanks for watching!